Uh, welcome everyone to the State of the Humanities, the Humanities and the State Lecture Series. This is the second one this term, sponsored by the Center for the Humanities at UNH. Many thanks to our director of the center, Bert Feinhook, for organizing these wonderful lectures. And I'd also like to thank Katie Umens for all her efforts in making these, these lectures such a success. The State of the Humanities examines the state of the humanities in society and here on campus and asks how our experiences reflect recent national dialogues. Some questions such as, uh, is there in fact a crisis in the humanities? Yes, um, I, I'm not debating that. <laughs> Maybe you have to, you can debate that, but. Uh, what constitutes a crisis? and what this all means for universities and for society. What is the humanities role and responsibility in preparing citizens for life in a diverse modern society? This lecture series was also spurred in part by the release of the National Academy of Arts and Sciences, The Heart of the Matter, which was kind of a counter effort to another report that came out in 2007 called Rising Above the Gathering Storm, which was, uh, which was a report that encouraged uh, the strengthening of education in STEM, uh, which we all know all about that. Uh, and uh, as a countermeasure, the members of the um, American Academy decided to organize a complementary effort on behalf of the humanities and the social sciences. It is the opinion of the Academy and our opinion as well that teaching students how to thrive in a 21st century democracy cannot be achieved by science or STEM-based education alone. I can think of no one better qualified to address the concerns of our series, or who is more articulate on these subjects, than Professor Doris Summer. Doris Summer is Ira Jewell William Professor of Romance Languages and Literatures, and she is the Director of Graduate Studies in Spanish at Harvard University. She is the author or editor of at least eight books. I, I tried counting, but it, I, I maybe got the count wrong, uh, including the much acclaimed Proceed with Caution when engaged by minority writing in the Americas and Bilingual Aesthetics, a new sentimental education. She is the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship, among many other awards and honors. Since 2002, Professor Summer has also served as the director of the Cultural Agency Initiative at the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies at Harvard. What does it mean to be a cultural agent? I'll, I'll let Professor Summer uh, answer that question in her talk. Uh, but I just wanted to say, from what I could gather from the website, uh, the Cultural Agents Initiative has sought to increase the impact of creative and scholarly practices by identifying artists, educators, and community leaders who have developed socially productive artistic practices by reflecting on the role of art in building civil society and by disseminating best practices through workshops and public forums. Uh, I, the, uh, I keep wanting to call her Dar, is, is that all right? <laughs> Dar, um, which I say in my, my natural accent from New Jersey uh, State, we, uh, 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 home, home, uh, homeland that we both share, <laughs> only towns away. So Dar is which they only pronounce that way in New Jersey, and I can't say Doris, it doesn't work. Um, has done uh, of yet another publication, her most recent, The Work of Art in the World, um, which looks over more than a decade of collaboration between artists and academics. Uh, she, in, the, in this um, volume, uh, she draws on intellectual sources that include Kant, Schiller, Dewey, and Ranciere. Among others, uh, Summer argues that the aesthetic training that fosters individual judgment underpins civic life and democracy. Her concern is not to teach pessimism and retreat from the world. Teaching despair to young people seemed to me not only tedious, but irresponsible compared to making a case for cultural agents. 
I leave you to talk further on cultural agents and only to say that uh, Professor Doris Summer has a lot to teach us. I also know that she will inspire and motivate us. Please join me in welcoming her to UNH. Thank you. The song now? Can you hear me? Is it, yeah? Thank you so much, Rachel. That <laughs> was <hard>. great. <laughs> that's great. Dar yeah, that's one reason that I prefer myself in Spanish because so siempre Doris, no? Doris. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here today, and um, I know I feel heroic for having gotten here. I hope that you do too, and generous, not only heroic, but generous with, uh, with your presence and your efforts um, to come here. <clears throat> I'm going to avoid this just because I'm little, and now I see I'm even littler than I thought, so I'll stand here too. Uh, you already have an idea of why we initiated a project called Cultural Agents, and that is uh, to offer an alternative to pessimism. Uh, how many of us have felt in courses or programs in the humanities over the last 30 years, those of us who have that trajectory, how many of us have felt that the humanities um, have been more or less identified with being very smart, very critical, very correct, and quite pessimistic. You know, if, if we're going to be right, if we're going to be smart, if we're going to know more than other people, then we become pessimistic because the systems are bad, nothing is working, and if you try to make them work, what happens when you try to make them work? Any Adorno readers here? You make things worse because you've bought into the system. So we've kind of survived an all-or-nothing approach to engagement that I think is lifting, because it's been a pall. It's lifting, and we're now talking at the level of courses, and, uh, and I see here at the level of institution, about how to engage the humanities in more risk-taking, in not always being right, but stretching uh, the boundaries of, uh, of what we do uh, and what we mean uh, by the humanities. Um, have the humanities always been uh, locked into being right, being reasonable, being smarter than everybody else, and not engaging in the world? Well, I'm glad to know that I'm with classicists here, right? Uh, and people who uh, do Renaissance uh, English literature, and you know that that's not the case. Cicero's my favorite example, not that I'm a classicist, but he's one of the earliest um, stars in, uh, in our galaxy of humanists. And he came out of um, his um, isolation, depressed after his daughter died. Uh, he came out of his isolation, why? Because his Greek teacher was being um, really threatened by, by the Roman courts with death. That's where he starts to deliver his best oratories. His best work is in direct response to a political uh, injustice. Um, just to give uh, another example, jumping a lot, Voltaire said, don't bother me with details of history if they don't make a difference in our future. Right? Uh, Milton was teaching us ethics and modesty and humility uh, in um, writing his long midrash on, uh, on, uh, on paradise. Uh, it's, it's hard to think of a major writer, uh, a major uh, artist in, in, uh, in any realm, who isn't fueled by a need to intervene in some kind of productive way in society. And yet humanists, when we study those works of art, act as if the intervention is just a, a circumstance rather than a motor. We talk about ideal audiences as if they weren't the public that wants to be motivated, that the, that the author or the artist wants to motivate by this work of art. Uh, we talk about an ideal audience as that audience which understands best, not which is fueled 
all right? So I think we need to um, loosen up our criteria as humanists and learn a lesson from artists. What do artists do? Artists take risks. Humanists are risk averse. Artists say, and my favorite formulation of this is uh, quoted by lots of artists, whether or not they know that Samuel Beckett um, coined the, uh, the expression. It, it comes from Endgame. Uh, one of the characters says, uh, try again, fail again, fail better. And this theme of failing better is both liberating and, uh, and uh, a, a burden of responsibility because it's not enough to fail, you have to do it better. Right? So what is it that we could do if we would take risks the way the artists whom we say we admire always do? By the way, what's the definition of art? I'm extemporizing here, we'll, we'll, we'll get to the slides, but because I'm with a few friends here, we can just be casual. What's, what's the definition of art? And I want to uh, defend my own discipline as a, a teacher of literature. I want to be able to quote, you know, uh, theorists who um, people even w without this ambition to intervene in the world would quote. Art is basically something new. If it's just pleasing, and it didn't surprise you, and it didn't confuse you, and it didn't make you say, hmm, I wonder what that is. I liked it, but I don't really get it yet. That's art. And, and I, I just made a little Kantian move there. Art is what is preconceptual. Well, he, he made that general for the aesthetic experience. Um, you can have that exper experience with nature, too. But when you see a sunset and you're grabbed by it, it's as if you've never seen anything like that before. So it's the surprise element which is important. That surprise element is a bit of confusion. You're delighted, but you're confused. And you have to ask the person next to you, or you're looking for an opportunity to ask someone, what do you think? And it's that moment when we are delighted and confused and have to talk to someone, or want to, to corroborate this feeling that we have the beginning of a social uh, negotiation, no matter what class or gender or race or nationality the other person comes from. So this is Kant's effort to establish what he calls a common sense, which is the sense or the sensation we have in common, which is the basis of political life. Without that aesthetic effect, which we can generate through art, there is no basis for a democratic political life because we'd have no way of cutting through those uh, inherited or acquired differences. When we all look at a sunset, it doesn't matter if we're rich or poor or male or female or young or old. We're all grabbed or not, but it's an incentive to talk about it, okay? So that's art. Art is something that pleases or confuses us. If we're talking about the sublime, it could just you know, be distasteful. It grabs us, and it makes us want to establish a relationship with someone else. Art is new. Art makes old things feel new. I'm referring to Shklovsky now. Uh, we can be formalists. We can be rigorously uh, engaged in aesthetic theory at the same time as we're engaged with the world. In fact, if we're not engaged with aesthetic theory while we engage in the world, what do we bring to the world except a feeling of noblesse oblige? We're here at the university. We can bring you an interesting conference. right? But if we're engaged in aesthetic theory and we can pick up that aesthetic moment outside of the classroom and say, look, you just got the point that Kant was making so many years ago on the basis of which he theorized a whole democratic uh, dynamic. Then we brought a tool to the outside world. By the way, I'm not uh, exaggerating when I say that the aesthetic effect is necessary for a democratic dynamic. 
Think about when modern aesthetics begins. What are, what, what, what's the time period? When is Kant writing his third critique? Huh? 1790, late 18th century, right? Late 18th century. Hey, there were for, people who were writing about aesthetics earlier, but he's, he's the one who really abstracted a lot of those concepts. 1790, when do we have movements of modern democracy, modern democratic republics? Same time. It's not a coincidence. They depend on one another. If you don't have a kind of gut feeling that makes you want to talk to people who are not from your class and gender and, and, uh, and language background, if you don't have something that will spark that desire to communicate, how are you going to get to democratic politics? And if you are trying to insist on a democratic politics without that gut feeling of wanting to engage with people who are different from you. You will do what the French revolutionaries d did and just forge ahead, whether people like it or not, because you've got reason on your side. You'll make a bloody mess. That's why Schiller wrote his letters on the aesthetic education of man. 1794, he wrote those letters, letters on the aesthetic education of man. And he says to his reader, who funded the, the letters, right, gave him some time to write. This is one of the princes of Denmark or Sweden. He says to his reader, although obviously he's addressing all of his readers, he says, uh, I bet you think this is untimely, <laughs> writing about aesthetic education. They're cutting each other's heads off on the streets of Paris, and I'm writing about aesthetic education. He says, you think this is untimely? But I have news for you. This is urgent. This is urgent. Why? Because the French revolutionaries think that because they have reason on their side, and the human being is reasonable par excellence, they just go on a straight track and cut everybody off who doesn't agree with them. Schiller says they forgot that human beings also have, along with reason, they have passion, they have bodies, they have appetites, they're messy. Passion and reason. We're practically civil wars, you know, in ourselves, walking down the street. He says, how do we as individuals survive that civil war of passion and reason? Huh? Why don't you beat yourself up constantly and not just once in a while when we feel guilty? What allows us to get through the day and say, huh, I got through the day, I did some interesting things or I learned some interesting, what allows us to live more or less with pleasure and feeling productive? He says, we have a third drive that nobody's talked about yet, but I want to talk about it. He says, reason is a drive. Look what it's driving right now. Passion is a drive. I don't have to tell anybody about that. But the third drive is the drive to be creative, the play drive. He coined a concept, the Spieltrieb. Read him. He writes about the Spieltrieb. What's the Spieltrieb? It is the drive. It's not just a faculty. It's the drive that turns conflict into an opportunity to have to do something. Somebody's calling you to do one thing, you haven't gotten out of the shower yet, what do you do? Well, uh, let's uh, have a conference call without the photo. Um, little everyday things. I'm cooking uh, here and I need uh, milk in the recipe and I don't have any milk. Well, let's use orange juice. You know, who in their everyday life doesn't make do constantly? This is a creative faculty and drive that we have that when we make art is in full gear, but it's always there. We have a play drive. Who has the play drive? Is it just the genius, exceptional artist, the way Kant thought? 
because Kant didn't talk a lot about art, but he, he said, because why bother? There are only a few geniuses. He loved art because art can communicate that which doesn't have a name yet. It's preconceptual. Art is what allows us that uh, structure of feeling that Raymond Williams will talk about hundreds of years later, right? It will describe something that doesn't have a name yet. Kant loved art because if you can communicate something that doesn't have a name yet, you can air out a difficulty before it blasts and explodes. So he loved art, but he thought that it was made by a few geniuses. And Schiller says, no way. Some are better at it than others, but we are all artists. That is the nature of the human being. A citizen, especially, has to understand him and herself as an artist, because the polity is not there yet. We're making it up. And those of us who live in democracies that say they're established know that the democracy has to be tweaked and remade and renamed constantly, otherwise it gets clogged. A citizen has to be an artist. And luckily, we all have the Spieltrieb. So Schiller says uh, we have to use it. So this is what I'm saying, that straight up classical thinking about the arts Rigorous aesthetic theory are our best allies when we engage in the world. So let me tell you uh, a couple of anecdotes about some cultural agents whom I think are, uh, who I think are spectacular. Um, by the way, if I just said what I said about citizens being artists, who is a cultural agent? Everybody. Everybody. Can you avoid it? When you say something to somebody, have you affected them? Yes. Just talking, just doing, just making, just inviting, just writing. Anything that you do that isn't already packaged, prepackaged, cliche, is a creative act. We're all cultural agents. The question is, how do we take responsibility and how do we expand the effect of what we can do through creativity? So I'll give you um, a couple of examples. Does anybody know Bogota, Colombia? You know Bogota. You know Bogota. You know Bogota in the back too? Are you from there? No? When, when were you in Bogota? Were you there? You know, you know where it is. Were you, were you in Bogota? When? Uh, early, 90s. early 90s. Tell us about Bogota in the early 90s. Um, All right, okay, re re repeat your confusion. <laughs> confusion. Um, just energy everywhere, um, traffic, people all over the place. Everybody talking. Um, did you amazing feel in contrasts? Did Did you feel safe? Yeah, I mean, not unsafe. Okay, well, nobody told you enough. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad because until the late '90s, uh, Bogota was on the advisory list for the State Department. In every international airport, there were signs, don't go to Bogota. And that wasn't only in the United States, that was all over Europe too. It was the only city we shouldn't go to because the State Department was not going to come after us. It was the most corrupt, the most complicated, the most confusing, uh, the most violent city in the Americas. It was hell. Kids who didn't have bodyguards, personal bodyguards, didn't go to school. Just to give you an example. Anybody who could afford to leave the city left. It was hellish. So the desperate city decided it would make a desperate move and hire a mayor who was a very unlikely mayor. He was not a politician. He was a nerd. He was a philosopher and mathematician. Right? Antanas Mokus. 
Antanas Mokus had recently le- uh, lost his job as president of the National University of Bogota. I'll tell you because we're a small group, all right? And he was inaugur- inaugurating the arts program at the National University. And the students, as they did in every public event, made so much noise you couldn't hear the speakers because the students were all revolutionary and the system was bad. So they wouldn't let anybody talk. And Mokus got up there very angry. He was doing this arts program. He knew young people would benefit from an arts program, and they weren't letting any of the professors or even himself speak. He got so angry. He tried one trick after another, because he's very clever. One trick after another, nothing worked. Finally, he turned around. You can see this on YouTube dropped his pants, and mooned the audience. (laughs) For real. And everybody was silent. (laughs) And so he picked up his pants, turned around, and finished the speech. And he felt very proud of himself. Until he got home and saw the newsreel, (laughs) and saw his own behind on the newsreel. (laughs) And um, he lost his job, (laughs) you know. The National University was not going to have this man as the president uh, of, uh, of the university. So he was available for a new job, and the desperate city of Bogota elected him mayor of Bogota in 1995. So for a month, you know, and, and here he is, he's known, he's, he's infamous as a, a kind of quirky guy. For a month, he's asking people what he can do to start making a difference in this impossible city. He's not going to take the drug lords on immediately. He wants to make some difference in the city so that people will get the idea that change is possible. Que si se puede. Right? And he asks everybody, he asks everybody, give me an idea. Let's, let's, uh, let's stop traffic deaths at least because the city was so complicated, right? So confusing and so loud, you didn't even notice where the traffic was coming. And there were a lot of traffic deaths, a lot of traffic deaths. So he says, let's at least start with traffic deaths. He got a, um, a Japanese consultancy to identify exactly where there were the most traffic deaths. And it turned out to be on the crosswalks. Cars were not stopping at crosswalks. Pedestrians thought that they could just walk comfortably, and, and they were picked off. So. He asked his aides for an idea, for an idea, for an idea. And nobody came up with anything. And finally, the uh, vice mayor said, Antanas, just forget it. Nothing to be done. It's time to bring out the clowns. That's a good idea, says Mokus. Time to bring out the clowns. So this is, this is Mokus's head, right? This is the way an artist thinks. You give a metaphor, you use a dead metaphor, you give an insult, and an artist will turn it around. So that's what he did. He brought out the clowns. He fired 20 uh, corrupt traffic police. They were all corrupt. But the 20 in the center of the city fired them and hired 20 pantomime artists. That's the first slide. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to show you a little video clip of, uh, of 1995. Yeah? That's, that's 1995, El, El Tiempo. Oh, yeah. All right, the, the little pink sign says, Incorrecto. <laughs> He's standing in front of a big bus. All right, let's, let's see what happens. Okay. Yo recuerdo que las cuando él empezó o oh, inventó Can los mimos, la prensa se reía de Antanas. De estos largos y oscuros túneles ubicados bajo el centro de Bogotá, se pre- um, he was um, engaged to marry the woman he's still married to, uh, and he said. I can't get married as a mayor. I can't get married in some private ceremony and invite my, my own friends and some dignitaries from the city. I'm, I'm a public 
servant. This has to be a public event. And they won't let me uh, get married in a big cathedral because they excommunicated me. He got married and divorced too many times. He's, he's a, a, you know, a believing Catholic, but he's excommunicated. Anyway, so he couldn't do the cathedral. Um, he was looking for a venue. Uh, and, uh, and, and his uh, future wife said, look, Antanas, if you want a three-ring circus for a wedding, just have it in the circus. So he did. <laughs> he did. He and his wife got on a, uh, an elephant, and they went into the uh, lion tamer's den. And the lion tamer had to whip the lions away from the poor elephant who was scared out of his life. But, but that's, the, um, that's the way that Antanas can hear uh, a, an unfriendly quip and, and turn it into useful, yeah. The, um, we, can, we can skip it, and I can just tell you where to find this on YouTube. There's a movie made by a Danish uh, filmmaker called Bogota Change, and it appears on YouTube in seven parts, and the mimes, I think, are in the second part, but the whole movie is worth seeing. Um, the second um, slide, as you saw, was uh, Mokus on the street with um, a big yellow and black star painted on it. Yellow and black are still the colors, and in Bogota too, that the police use when there's danger. So he, uh, an artist friend said, you want to stop traffic deaths? Let's commemorate every place there's been a traffic death with a, uh, a falling star that also looks like a cross. So this is a cross between a star and, uh, and, the, and the cross to show these deaths. And the, the city was just clogged with these paintings for a very long time. And you notice when you cross the street, you notice those commemorations. So, uh, so people were much more careful. In one year, the, um, the number of traffic deaths were reduced by half. One thing that Mokus knows how to do is statistics. He's a good mathematician, and he has friends who do uh, statistics, too. So uh, we know uh, some of the statistics that accompanied his um, two regimes. He was uh, elected twice. Um, when he did go after the traffic uh, lords, the, uh, the, the drug traffic lords, the results were astounding because he had one of these clever interventions after another. Over the 10 years of his two regimes, because there was a, um, a hiatus uh, between them, the, tr the traffic deaths continued to, uh, to descend, but the homicide rate went down by almost 70%. The homicide rate. The tax base went up almost 300%, threefold. Why? Because Mokus was, here's one of the stars. Thank you so much. Um, everyone knew he was honest. He had nothing to do with his money. He's like the, the recent president of, uh, of Uruguay, Mujica, right? Who still drives his, his little Volkswagen bus and lives in the outskirts of, uh, of the capital. He's beloved. He's obviously honest. And people said, I'll pay my taxes now, especially because the taxes were connected with particular public works that were urgent. Um, so 300% uh, increase. Super Civico, another artist came to him and said, you are Super Civico. He said, I have, an, I have just the outfit for you. So he wore that a couple of times to work. <laughs> He wore that, and, and, and one day, walking to work, a woman stopped him and said, Mr. Mayor, you know, get more serious. So he took it off, you know. <laughs> Not right there, to put. He didn't come back with it. Okay, now I want to uh, go to uh, an example of another cultural agent, because we could talk about Mokus forever. In fact, I like to. But, um, and he is the inspiration, by the way, for much of the peace process that's going on in Colombia now. Of course, the government is negotiating with the FARCs in Havana. That was something that they were uh, considering before. But the whole project in Colombia now of constructing a peace is all around the kind of 
um, cultura ciudadana, civic culture that Mocos pioneered during his uh, mayorship. Okay, this is a picture from the capital of Albania, Tirana, Albania. Does anybody know who the, uh, the current prime minister of Albania is? Good, because I get to tell you. His name is Edi Rama. He was mayor of the capital for three terms uh, before he got elected just a year ago, prime minister. What Edi Rama did before he came back to Albania uh, was do his art. He's a painter. He had a studio in Paris. He lived well. He's a very elegant man, very elegant. And he was successful. And uh, he came back to his father's funeral. People said, you have to stay, you have to run for mayor. So he did, and he won. And you can imagine that in 2000, when he came back and won his mayor, uh, it was 10 years after the Soviets had left. It was 10 years of vigorous mafioso activity in an ex-Soviet capital, in a gray ex-Soviet capital with illegal building, with a polluted river, with uh, you know, business by any means. Okay? This, these are before and after pictures. It's like you know, going to a plastic surgeon. <laughs> these are before and after pictures. And he, I guess he intentionally took them in black and white and then in full color. But I'll show you some more. Okay? He took down illegal buildings. And what he did with, the, with his own money because there was no money in the, in the public coffers, is buy enormous buckets of very brightly colored paint. And he designed the facades of several buildings in the capital. And he got the neighbors of these Soviet-style uh, apartment buildings to be the painters with his design. OK, I'll, I'll just stay there uh, for a moment. Uh, when people started painting their own buildings and enjoying being on the streets, they started picking up garbage. They, they realized that they needed a garbage truck. They started paying their uh, city taxes again. The World Bank saw this and they said, this is where we want to invest. The Soros Foundation said, this is where we want to donate money. And he got major... Uh, major contributions, and you should just log on to Tirana, Albania, and see the before and after pictures. And many of the after pictures have these garishly colored buildings that just make people happy. They make them laugh. They make them laugh. The first building that, um, that he painted, uh, he has a very good TED talk, Edi, E-D-I, Rama, R-A-M-A. -A. He has a good TED talk. Uh, that he did just before he won um, the um, prime minister uh, role. And he says, uh, we, we did the first building, bright orange. He, that was before he, he came up with designs, bright orange. And somebody from the European Union, a representative from the European came and, and was going to stop uh, us painting. He said, well, why are you going to stop us? He said, well, because uh, this color doesn't uh, conform with European Union uh, aesthetic uh, criteria. He, and Drama says, Albania doesn't conform with European You know, you're going to stop us? If you stop us, I'm going to hold a press conference right here and say that we were censored from using orange. <laughs> and, and what's wonderful about that TED Talk is he says, what happened when we painted that building is that everything stopped. It's as if there were a big traffic jam. It's as if a rock star came into town. Everybody stopped, looked at it, and started talking to each other. It's as if he had read those passages from Kant and used them right there on the street. It was an aesthetic effect that created this lateral relationship among people who were too afraid to look at each other, you know, a day before. All right? So that's Edi Rama. Now, um, here, I think this is the last, oh, okay. Oh, there's no going back. Oh, all right. Uh, there's no going back. Okay, this is a project called Shovels for Pistols, Palas por Pistolas, and it's the theme of the cover of my book. 
This is one of the installations that, uh, that Pedro Reyes did from Palas por Pistolas. Pedro Reyes is um, a well-known and still very young artist in Mexico. And before he met cultural agents, he thought that art was one thing and social work was another. He didn't want to compromise any aesthetic value for political effects. He was very refined. But then someone invited him at Harvard to do a project, a whole exhibition at the, at the Carpenter Center on the future. And he got stuck. He said, hmm, if I do something about the future, I'm just going to depress people and myself. And I don't like to be depressed, so I'm stuck. And then he started talking to us. I said, well, why don't you see what Antanas did? Why don't you see what Augusto Boal did in theater? Why don't you look at some cultural agents? He said, oh. He went to meet Antanas. He learned from Antanas. And Antanas has a, um, a slogan that I want to share with you uh, as, a, as a political leader. He says, when I feel stuck, when there's nothing to be done, I ask myself, what would an artist do? So he thinks like an artist. What would an artist do? He met Antanas, and he's the artist. So he has to do something. And what he did after meeting Antanas is tell a collector who was about to commission a statue from, uh, from Pedro, he told the collector, you don't need another statue, Mr. Collector. What you need to do is be my partner in a new project that we'll call Palas por Pistolas. We'll do a buyback of uh, illegal arms in this very violent town of Culiacan. And since you want to invest in me, let's uh, have a series of vouchers available for people who want to hand in their guns. So the collector prepared $500 vouchers, and people gave in their guns and walked home with a TV or a microwave or a bicycle or something, something good. And uh, they collected, in two months, in Culiacan, 1,532 weapons. And they weren't pistols. They were machine guns. They were rifles. They were, you know. What do you do with a pile of so many arms, firearms? They have to go to the government. You don't own decommissioned arms. They went to the government. What Pedro did, refined Pedro, who didn't you know, descend to do social work, he not only negotiated with a businessman to, to give vouchers to uh, people who had illegal arms, he then went to the army and said, look, let's make a deal. To the Mexican army that has no credibility, <laughs> moral or even efficacious credibility, he went and he negotiated with the Mexican army and said, look, we have a pile of, of weapons, we have to give it to you, but if you separate the metal from the, uh, from the wood, you can sell the metal to Trooper Shovel Factory. They'll pay you good money. And that's what they did. And, and Trooper Shovel Factory made as many shovels as there had been firearms. And the project continues because now they are planting as many trees as there are shovels and were firearms. Okay? So that's conceptually uh, what Pedro is capable of now. It's related to artwork that we know from Joseph Boys. It's got, you know, a distinguished trajectory as, as artwork. And it's just beautifully effective. So effective that the Mexican army now dumps <laughs> more arms on Pedro. And he has a new series that, uh, that I just mentioned here. Um, Duke University Press didn't let me put in more, more pictures. But if you look at Pedro, um, Reyes on, uh, on Google, and look at a project called Disarm, you'll see a series of very beautiful musical instruments made from pistols, made from rifles, made from all sorts of things. And they, they play music. He has musicians who put on concerts with these things. So um, th those, are, those are the slides uh, that I wanted to show you. Uh, I talked briefly about why um, aesthetic theory um, and political philosophy are important elements for us as we develop cultural agents. But I've still stayed at the level of uh, academics inside the classroom and, and uh, as a publication uh, project. 
When I take seriously Schiller, who says we are all artists, and I interpret that to mean, and therefore also cultural agents, I ask myself, what am I doing as an artist? Right? What am I doing? How do I make myself responsible to these ideas? And my only work, my only talent, is to teach language and literature. I don't do anything else. So we created a program that takes these lessons into the street, into the public schools, and teaches language and literature at the highest level I'm capable of through art making. And that's what we call pretexts. And if um, this, this little book, uh, which is, represents, you know, probably 15 years of work, has one of its short chapters is on pretexts. We call this pretext because with some colleagues and graduate students and even some undergraduates, one exceptional one from Zimbabwe who, who did pretext in Zimbabwe and won a Rhodes Scholarship and, and, uh, and is now working with us um, to develop more work in Africa. Pretexts is a program that takes any text as classical, as difficult, even as boring as, as, uh, as can be, because we've worked with the um, unit of victims in, uh, in Colombia to address the question of uh, symbolic reparation and reparation in general. So we've, we've worked with legalese. I hope I'm not offending anybody. But it's not immediately attractive as text. We've worked with any text. We've worked with physics text. We've worked with history text. We've worked with sociology text. We've certainly worked with philosophical texts and many literary texts. Take any text and use it as an excuse, as a pretext, to make art. Take a text into a classroom, into a, uh, a cultural center, into you know, uh, a park, and say to kids, here are some crayons. Let's draw a feeling from this, con from, from this story, or a character, or anything. Let's draw. And then as you, we're done drawing, OK, now we're going to dance it. OK, now we're going to sing it. OK, now we're going to act it. We, we'll take pictures. Whatever art form is available, whatever the kids are interested in, whatever we can facilitate with, with our crew, whatever the kids can facilitate, that's the art form. If we are in a, um, uh, a town where hip hop is possible, we do hip hop. If, we, if people are doing decimas somewhere else in Latin America, we do decimas. If the, we're with weavers, if we're with cookie uh, decorators, it doesn't matter. The art form is a popular vehicle for dealing with a difficult text. So we have made cookies based on uh, Aeschylus' Prometheus Bound. <laughs> you should have seen the winged dog eagle, huh? And those drips of red coloring. But the way that people can read deeply when they're making art, when they're using it, when they become users and not receivers, is astounding. Now, I hope you're skeptical enough to ask yourself, how are you going to get somebody to read Prometheus Bound to start with before they make art? Well, we don't presume anything. We don't presume anything. And because we're, we're also Latin Americanists in the mix, what we do is start off a workshop by preparing materials, getting people to make whatever it is, a book, if we're uh, kind of sampling this uh, Latin American tradition of making cardboard books, recycling, right? The cartoneras. We can make books, we can do cookies, we can make costumes. We have stuff. And people start making things. And when they get into making, when they're not thinking of design, but making, someone with a nice voice reads the text. Does anybody find that a familiar gesture? Does anybody know what scene that um, revives? They read the text so that later people can talk about it. Illiterate people can talk about it. That's the tobacco factory. Any Caribbean will recognize this scene. Tobacco rollers 
I'm not talking about the, the deveiners, and I'm not talking about the sowers, and I'm not talking about the harvesters, but the most elite tobacco workers were the rollers. Just think about natural material turning into a cigar that can cost hundreds of dollars. These are fine artisans, and they know it, and they're not replaceable. And if they want something from the boss, the boss listens, because they can't replace 300 tobacco rollers. Impossible. So the tobacco rollers decided that they didn't want to be bored, and they were very dignified, and they should be using the time in the tobacco factory, it's a workshop, uh, to learn whatever they wanted to learn. So they would hire a reader, an actor, a radio announcer later on, to read something that they chose. And what did they choose? Good novels, history, philosophy, some scientific material. And the reader read all morning. And the workers talked about the text all afternoon. Many of them were illiterate, but they were all intellectuals, all of them. Uh, have you ever wondered why a brand of Cuban tobacco is called Romeo and Juliet? Or Monte Cristo? Or think about some other tobacco you know, brands that you know that have the titles of important 19th century works and earlier works. These are works that the tobacco rollers chose to listen to. And they chose to listen to Marx and Engels, too. And the poor bosses couldn't fire them. Could not fire them. Tobacco factories were the place where unions were made, too, not just cigars. What did Samuel Gompers do for a living, by the way? He rolled tobacco. He rolled tobacco at tables with his Puerto Rican and, and Cuban co-workers. They all figured out how to organize because they had a captive audience. You could read newspapers and political tracts and get into serious conversations during the workday. And so the, to, the Tobacco uh, Rollers Union is the first organized labor union in the United States, and it's obviously the, uh, the basis of organized labor all over the Caribbean. Don't forget New York is part of the Caribbean. I tell everybody that and they laugh, but it's true, it's the Northern Caribbean. It's just one island. What's the best thing about New York? It's so close to the United States. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's what we do. We train teachers, K through 12, we train teachers in the Boston area, but less because everything is in flux now in, in the Boston area, but all over Latin America and in several places in, uh, in Africa now. And we want to do this more and more. We want to do this in New Hampshire. We train teachers to step down from being an authority and become facilitators. How much do you need to know to be a facilitator for an art project? when you can say to somebody, oh, that's a good question, figure it out. <laughs> you don't need to know a lot to teach a lot. You become a friendly, empty space. And you can tell people to explore, to talk to each other. One of the things that we do is use difficult material as raw material, as I say, for an art project. The other thing we do is tell people to go off on tangents. You know how in school they always told us not to go off on tangents? because that was distracting from what was important. But going off on a tangent meant we were interested in something, we were curious about something. So we tell people, go off on tangents. And in the morning, or the first move in, in a workshop, if, if it's in the afternoon, is hanging up the tangents on a clothesline. We publish on clotheslines the way people still do in the northeast of Brazil, where there's no other way to publish. Literatura de Cordel, because there's no money to publish. So this is the broadside tradition in English literature that's still alive. Okay? But instead of trees or, or the sidewalk, you, you hang it up on a clothesline. And people come in with their tangents, and they hang them up. So for example, in Brazil, we did Prometheus Bound. I learned what some of my colleagues already knew, and that is that the um, the pantheon of Greek gods matches up 
almost exactly, exactly, figure for figure, with the Yoruba Orishas. I had to be in an Afro-Brazilian environment to learn obvious things, right? People bring in a study of mythology. People could bring, and somebody else brought in a study of Greek columns. There's a lovely image there of shaking the columns of, of the earth. Uh, somebody else brought in a study of um, uh, liver with onions. <laughs> somebody else, it doesn't matter what people brought in, but the fact is that they read a lot to make their funny or interesting contribution. So whereas pretexts gets deeper and deeper and, and creates more and more layers for the, the complex fragment that we're playing with, it keeps expanding the uh, range of relevant and related materials for as many readers as they are, there are in the room. So we don't have to talk about classic material being relevant. They found the connection right there. Right? So th this is part of the, um, of the dynamic of pretext. And I have to say that it's what keeps me excited about my, my teaching career. We do pretexts in Harvard. And with Harvard people, we do pretexts outside of Harvard. We're at the um, Bach Center for Teaching and Learning. So I have colleagues who do pretexts in their classrooms now. Um, and, uh, and in uh, our department, we, we use it a lot. Um, but the most fun is going to uh, K through 12 schools and telling teachers that they are not the enemies, that they don't have to be replaced by Teach for America, you know, young people, uh, that they are interesting and worthy and creative people, and they should relax and not have to be authorities. That's the only thing that, you know, that hurts us. And their kids read more, enjoy more, and, um, and learn more. And, and indirectly, we're, uh, we're getting kids to do much better on their, on their exams. We're not teaching to, uh, to the exam. In, in Spanish, there's an expression um, that goes, uh, la letra con sangre entra. You know that one, right? You, you, you learn by suffering. Letters go into you through blood. You learn by suffering. La letra con sangre entra. But all the, all the neuroscientists now are telling us that that's wrong, that it's dopamine, that it's pleasure that allows for deep and lasting learning. When we're in moments of deep pleasure, when we're engaged pleasurably by difficult material, that's when the magic happens. So we need to have more pleasure and difficulty. And that's another reason that cultural agents make so much sense, to me at least, because Artists know that they're working hard, but that it's pleasurable. That a problem is not a problem, it's a challenge, and therefore it's delicious. So if, we, if we look at the world not as artists, we see obstacles, we see problems. If we just change the chip and make a problem into a challenge, we energize that pleasure principle. And they come up with something that doesn't work, and we say, OK, that didn't work, instead of saying it can't be done. And we fail better. So thank you so much for your attention. I'm really delighted to be in this very uh, special group of people with, uh, with important horizons. And um, please consider me an interlocutor and, uh, and friend of, of your projects. Thank you. Professor Summer, do you want to take a few questions? Sure, I do. I have a mic. I really don't need a microphone right now. Just a quick something I missed. Um, you said uh, you found that a pantheon of the Greek gods matches up to the what? I didn't catch Yoruba. It. Uh, Yoruba is a culture that's um, most of Nigeria is identified with Yoruba culture. And the Yoruba, uh, this is uh, an interesting... Um, Yoruba? Yoruba. Yoruba. Y-O-R-U-B-A. Uh, it's, it's like the most important African culture in the Caribbean. And I have a friend who actually studied this. And 
He, he, uh, he asked himself, why is Yoruba more important than the Congolese culture when there were more uh, people from the Congo uh, forced to the Americas? And the reason he decides uh, and traces very convincingly is that um, the Yoruba people in Brazil were taught by English missionaries to write. And so they documented the, the uh, lore and, and, uh, and the history and the practices of a Yoruba tradition. And so it, it kind of uh, got a modern cachet for the Europeans and then for Africans as well. So it's the uh, Brazilian African returnees to Nigeria who got the Yoruba tradition to be recognized by the British Empire as substantial. OK. Yeah. And the, um, the author whom I'm referring to is um, um, James R. Matori, M-A-T-O-R-Y. So can you spell all that, that again? I'm sorry. M-A-T-O-R-Y. Matori. Yeah. He's a Duke now. He, he was at Harvard for a long time and um, a good anthropologist and historian. Thank you. When you were... Um Talking about Schiller and at other points as well, I was thinking about children. I mean, children seem so irrepressibly creative, imaginative, artistic, that it's hard to not assume that it's a deeply natural state for us. Exactly. And if anything, it seems to, it at least seems on a face to diminish over time as Why? we, I don't know, but it does seem, uh, it seems as if it does, what? right? You go to a classroom, huh? You go to a classroom and you say, I have an idea. And what does the teacher say? Keep it to yourself. Don't go off on a tangent. Or a parent says, so many questions. But you're right. It's so hardwired. And it's such an effort on our part to stamp it out and stamp it out. But we managed to do it after a while. You know, our teachers say that second graders are have a lot of fun in art class. By the time they're fifth graders, mm, I don't know how to draw. I don't want to do this. <laughs> We're good. We're good at, at, at stamping, uh, stamping that out. The first thing that we do after hearing a difficult text, th this is part of the protocol of pretext. The protocol is very simple and has very few rules. But one rule is, after we hear a text, everyone asks a question. We, we try to recover this childish curiosity. So even if you didn't understand anything, by the time you hear 30 questions, you're starting to get a shape of, you know, just the questions are good. Ask a question. In conventional classrooms, who asks the questions? Huh? That just happened. Right? The teacher. The te and how many answers are there for a question? How are we going to make creative, curious people with this kind of dynamic? Although you're right, we just uh, rehearsed it. But, but the one lovely thing about pretext and that I've learned from Boal, from Mokos, from, from lots of uh, brilliant uh, leaders here <coughs> is that citizenship, sustainable citizenship we were talking about, is based on a, on a deep feeling. And the deep feeling is not tolerance. Tolerance is not a deep feeling. And what is tolerance anyway? Everybody talks about tolerance in citizenship. What, what does it mean to tolerate somebody? <laughs> exactly. Did everybody hear? Did everybody hear? You just say, say it. To force yourself to put up with the other. OK. So is that a basis for citizenship? What Antana says and what Boal said is that the basis of citizenship is admiration. 
If you don't admire somebody, if you don't anticipate something clever or useful or generous or something from somebody, you don't really listen in. You don't really engage. And the lovely thing about pretext is if you tell everybody to draw or everybody to dance or everybody to sing or, you know, somebody is going to come up with a talent here or there or somewhere else, everyone's going to come up with some talent and you are going to admire everyone in that room after a week or two. Everybody. How is it possible to bully anyone when you admire everyone? Do you want to eliminate people? Do you want to make them shut up? Do you want to make them not come to class? If you say, hmm, that kid's going to come up with a design that I'm not going to think of. Let's see what he comes up with. Let's see what kind of tangent this crazy kid came in with. You know, the, the liver and onions was bad enough. I want to see what he comes up with next time. When everyone is different and smart, you start admiring and not wanting to eliminate anybody. So pretext is also this training in sustainable citizenship because it's based on this artistic and uh, curiosity-based play drive. Um, I have a little question um, that starts with a, an old joke. Please. Um, <laughs> how do you get to Carnegie Hall? 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration. Um, so I see the inspiration part. Mm -hmm. Well, what about the perspiration part? Ah. Ah. Not a problem? It's, it's an enormous problem, but it's done with pleasure. I spend lots of time in Boston public schools. We do workshops with teachers. Then we have to make site visits with teachers. And then we go and to the family nights and see parents being facilitated by their children around some difficult text. It's a lot of time, it's a lot of work, but how much pleasure is that? Yeah, we do double duty. We do double duty. And in general, uh, the cultural agents class and, and, um, and independent work that, uh, that students do around this, it's double duty, it's not one or the other. I, I have colleagues in other universities who want to be considered for tenure and promotion around their um, civic engagement. Right? You know that argument? I say, mm -mm 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 -mm. because if your research and writing isn't fueling what you do in your civic engagement, uh, it may derail into just noblesse oblige. You know, it's got to be collaborative. You have to be sweating. You have to be doing double double duty. Yeah. Well, I guess the perspiration part was the um, uh, when I was a kid, I yeah did. Um, go to New York to take piano lessons, uh -huh. which was pleasurable. <laughs> uh, but the en endless hours of practice, yeah. that wasn't so much fun. <laughs> I mean, it, it could be okay, fun, um, but how uh, do you teach? Okay, I'm going to say one, one very specific thing about music education. Who here knows about El Sistema in Venezuela? You, you do. You have students? Do you, do you want to say a word about El Sistema? You probably know more than... I'll let, 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 let you talk about it. Oh, okay. okay. About 40 years ago, this economist named Jose Antonio Abreu in Venezuela got tired of going to classical music concerts where there were only foreign musicians. He said, we're a musical people, we're smart, we have money, we have no, no classical uh, musicians. We have publics that would go to a classical concert, here I am with other people, we have no classical, how come? So he decided he would hire some teachers and teach kids to play classical music. The privileged kids already had other things to do after school, they weren't interested. But the poor kids, huh? That's what he discovered. The poor kids wanted to learn classical music. So he, he hired teachers, he bought violins, he bought pianos, he bought, and he created a system of teaching classical music that works in groups and teams, not to say bands and orchestras, as if it's an after-school sport. So kids aren't bored by practicing. They practice together because they want to sound good in the practice tomorrow. And they, they turned classical music instruction into a social 
medium. And, uh, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a brilliant, it's, uh, it's the only good news about Venezuela. It's still good news. They just started a, a Sistema Nucleus in a, um, I don't know if you know about this, in um, a cancer ward, a children's cancer ward. And the children are doing much better in their health uh, indices. They're doing much better. They have a purpose. They have friends they need to support. I, yeah, it makes me cry. If you, want, if you want a tearjerker, all right, that's one. But log on to, to YouTube and look for, maybe we can find it here, the, the um, Philharmonic Orchestra on YouTube. The um, landfill, excuse me, it's called the landfill. Landfill Harmonic Orchestra. Because Venezuela still has some money, and it, and it has this very important nationwide program called El Sistema, and there are Boston programs and Los Angeles programs and lots of programs that are based on El Sistema. What are you going to do in a place like Paraguay that has no money? No money. Do you know about this? The Landfill Harmonic? OK. Do, do, yeah, just a couple of minutes. I don't know if this has subtitles, but I'll, I'll, oh yeah. Talk about cultural agents. My name is Ada Maribel Rios Bogado. I have 13 years old and I play the violin. My name is Juan Manuel Chávez, más conocido como Baby. I have 19 years old and I play the cello. Este chelo está hecho de una lata de aceite, la madera tirada en la basura y las clavijas son de una vieja cuchara para golpear la carne y para hacer el ñoqui. Y suena así. <música> un lugar para tener un violín. De hecho, el violín, un violín cuesta más que su casa. En ese grupo acá mismo encontramos el colado de violín. This is the y ese que empezamos los instrumentos reciclados. La familia que acá vive recicla todo lo que hay en la basura. Anyway, no pensaba you antes should, que yo voy a hacer esa You, you should see more videos related to landfill harmonic, okay? Because you'll see testimonies you'll see testimonies of kids who say if it weren't for this, I would be part of a gang or I would go hungry or I would do this or I would do there's nothing that can stop people who recognize themselves as artists. What are they going to say? We're not Venezuela. We don't have instruments. We don't have instructors. Or from guts, you make a heart. That, that's the expression in the Caribbean. De tripas corazón. Right? From just strings, ugly strings, you make the motor for your being. And, uh, you know, these are these are brilliant cultural agents. If if you look around you, you know that you have that you know cultural agents who are worthy of study. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you.